Okay, so make sure that the grades have been updated. Um, so keep that in mind. Okay, propaganda project. We're gonna roll out this project here, okay? This is super exciting for me. Um, I think propaganda in the era of Hitler and Nazi Germany is extremely cool. Um, if you've never looked it up before, I really, really welcome you to do, okay? How this is gonna work here, you can see this little sentence, find a series of propaganda advertisements or a single propaganda advertisement, so one or multiple, and analyze why they helped or even hurt the Nazi regime or hurt the outsiders in the Nazi uh, regime at the time. So, yeah. What's propaganda? Propaganda is media that is expressed uh, as uh, to evoke emotion. So, um, a lot of some something like advertisements can be considered propaganda if they have political motives. You guys remember the um, the Gillette commercial about toxic masculinity? That would be a form, the Super Bowl commercial like a year or two ago. No. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Yes, that's a great one. Uh, yeah, I Want You for U.S. Army by Uncle Sam. That, you've, everybody's seen that, right? That's a great form of propaganda. It's American propaganda there. Okay? So it's meant to evoke some sort of emotion there, basically. Okay? So um, I'll show you the rubric here. And this is on uh, the seminar schedule here. Okay, So you're able to pull it up. Here's the, here's the project rubric. This is what I'm going to be using to grade. Okay? Um, so you have proficient, satisfactory, apprentice, or novice, okay? If you didn't do much at all for it, then you're novice, okay? If you went above and beyond, you were proficient in it, okay? Pretty simple. I'm going to focus on content delivery, how you argue and present the topic or the project, how well you researched it, um, how well you mechanically drafted the project, looking at spelling, grammar, um, professionalism in the argument, um, and then the styling and creativity, okay? So how well you thought as a historian, how, thought, how well you wrote as a historian, all of that stuff there, okay? So properly source formatting, um, looking at page numbers, following all the directions according to this rubric, uh, paying attention to different details, and then just looking at the creativeness of that piece, okay? Um, we have to understand that propaganda in the time of Hitler and Nazi Germany was extremely important because it got millions of people to get on track with it, okay? That's what's so important, okay? I also have a list of different ideas, okay? This is just stuff that I made up literally like Monday, okay, before the seminar started. Um, so you can go down this list and check it out. You can look at film propaganda in the Third Reich. You can look at books. You can look at um, a specific time of Nazi Germany and when they were doing it because you will see that the propaganda has changed and changed over time. You can do it over that. Um, you can look at Joseph Goebbels, which we'll talk about here on Friday and Monday, um, about how he, as the Reich's Minister of Propaganda, really changed that uh, aspect. You can look at newspapers, you can look at stamps, you can look at the concept of parades, you can look at ceremonies. Honestly, it doesn't really matter to me about your propaganda. Just if you have something that's unique that's not on this list, I welcome you to come and talk to me about it, okay? It could be a single piece of work. It could be a single poster. It could be a painting. It could be um, a film. It could be a two-hour long film. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that's out there in terms of Nazi propaganda uh, during the time of the Third Reich that you can look forward to. So check that out. And I will tell you too, I, I didn't preface this. This is not required as part of getting your history grade. Okay? This is for if you want to get a little bonus learning target uh, for history, or if you're looking to get a speaking and listening target, if you're looking to get a presentation target, um, those are kind of your options there. Okay, so this is gonna be really good for you. Um, there's a great resource on here, it's from the Holocaust Encyclopedia. It really digs deep into Nazi propaganda. Um, so that's something to check out too, okay? You got about a week and a half uh, before this is due. It's going to be due February 8th at 1 o'clock, okay? So literally just about two weeks or so um, for you to work on this, okay? This would be outside of the seminar time when you're working on this because it is supplemental, okay? It's optional. Again, you don't have to do it. However, if you're looking to get as the maximum amount of English targets in here, if you're looking to get a bonus history target to make it like 
one point or uh, one point two or something like that, this is a great option for you, okay? So I like offering these things as a little extra bonus, okay? All right, there's that. Like I said, due Monday, February 8th, opportunity for English targets, okay? For Friday, I'm finishing up the research project. I'll roll that out on Friday, okay? So then you'll have two uh, projects available. Sorry, I got lip skin. Yummy. Yeah. 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 Um, Friday, we'll do uh, the research project. If you need to get your uh, four research targets, like 3A through 3D, I think it was the four of them. Uh, you're welcome to do that in here as well for English targets if you want to get some of that too. Okay? So, don't tell me that you didn't get the opportunity to earn English targets in here because you definitely are. Okay? I'm loading you guys up with stuff. I'm probably almost overwhelming you with, with stuff that you can possibly get. Okay? So, I really, really welcome you to take advantage of that if you can. All right, moving on. <clears throat> Today. We're going to be talking about the Weimar Republic again. We'll be talking about uh, Hitler's emergence and rise as a leader. Okay, We've already kind of talked about it earlier. We've discussed different uh, uh, topics and different perspectives. Um, I really, really loved the discussion we had on Monday. Um, everybody did a great job on that. Um, I will just say, for future reference, um, I did have, I did only count... Um, I think it was 15 people out of the 32 of you that are in here um, as present for the day because a lot of you did not speak, okay? So it is the responsibility of not only yourself, but other people to involve each other, okay? This kind of, when you're in a discussion, it is a team effort. It's not just a one person overpowering the other. Now, you have a discussion leader or leaders, but that doesn't mean they get to run the show necessarily, they are the ones asking the questions and looking for depth of information, okay? So, when we have another discussion, which I don't know when, I think it'll be sometime in February, um, make sure that you're staying involved, okay? Because, like I said, I counted you absent if I marked that you did not speak. Um, and if you have any question about that or if you don't know whether you got counted or not, I have the discussion sheet here. You're welcome to check it out. Um, and just to kind of give an overview of what we discussed on Monday, I'll just go down the list here real quick. Um, radicalism, the rise of Hitler, Hitler as an orator, the confidence of Adolf Hitler, uh, beliefs and misunderstandings of modern media and uh, Nazi media, women in the Third Reich, leadership and speaking, just generally. Talked about uh, this, the discretion with currency. We were talking about historical issues with the concept of currency. Um, Anti-Semitic history. Um, influence of the media. Talking about the lost generation of World War I. Looking on the idea of opinions versus fact. And judgments versus... Um, I can't read that. Oh, it just says opinions and judging. Um, and then the 1928 press in Weimar, Germany, okay? So we went over a lot of topics is what I'm saying. So make sure you don't have to say anything academic. Honestly, one, one student got his uh, point, he got his presence for saying, I agree with this, and here's why. I, I forget who it was specifically, but he says, I just agree with this. He says, I don't really know why, but I agree with what she said or something, and I counted that, okay? You don't really, the simple fact is you, you didn't really have to contribute a lot to the conversation. Sure, it would be nice if you did. But you could say, I agree with this because blank, blah, 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 blah. And that would have counted, okay? So, if you have any questions on that, on whether or not you were counted, please come talk to me, okay? Um, because your participation in the seminar, again, participation and attendance and discussion is huge. And if you missed that, sorry, okay? All right. <clears throat> Today is going to be kind of a weird day. Um, it's very complicated. Today is a complicated day for me. Uh, the reason why is because we're looking at the emergence and rise of Adolf Hitler specifically in detail. Um, and I think Jackson Spielvogel, the writer of this book, what we're kind of following along with, the longer reading that you had the other day, 
follows along with this book specifically. It is, it is the book, actually. Um, he does a really, really good job of explaining it in as, as few pages as possible. Um, if I were to talk to you about the emergence and rise of Adolf Hitler, I probably could not do it in an hour. I probably couldn't do it in two days. It would probably take me a, literally about three weeks worth of talking to you about it. So what I'm going to do today is kind of boring. Hopefully you like it. I don't know. Um, I'm going to just kind of read through it. And as we're reading through, if you guys have questions or you have a point you want to discuss, you're welcome to interrupt me and, and talk about it. Okay? Um, so it's kind of going to be like a reading discussion hybrid combo. Okay? If that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's encouraged for you to take notes. However, I'm not going to be uh, very scrutinous about this. Okay. All I ask you is kind of make sure you pay attention as best as possible, um, and then we can go from there. Okay. So it's it's about 15 pages long. So it's going to be a little bit a little bit of a read along here. Okay. So so bear with me. That's why I'm sitting down because. I can't stand and read the whole time, okay? And again, if you have something you want to talk about, you have a point you want to emphasize or raise or question, don't be afraid to ask. Yeah? I think you stole my notebook. Mmm. That brings me to my next point. I need to give you guys back your quizzes. Uh, Isabella, here's your notebook. And Garrett, here's your notebook. And then I'll give you guys back your quizzes towards the end of the, the seminar here. Go ahead and set it down here for me. I'll just test it out. Or... It's okay. I'm just going to casually relocate myself. Okay. So I'm not and distracted. for you guys up here, is it cool? Got gotcha. you. Okay, sounds good now. Uh, no, you're fine. Um, is it cool? My guy's in front of us. I take off my mask to do the reading. Mm -hmm. You guys cool with that? I'm scared. Okay. I have to say that on camera. I know you guys were cool before the class started, but I just want to make sure. <laughs> All right, here we go. And you guys are welcome to like circle around in the ABC rug if you have it, and, and I'll show you a good picture. Oh yeah, I got visuals too here too, so it kind of help you out a little bit better too. So it's kind of like me lecturing, but it's a little bit more not my words, not my tirades. Anyways. Thank you for the visual aid. I'm trying here, guys. Really trying my best. But there, like I said, there's just no. No, I really tried a better way to do it, and I just could not, my brain could not function, so we just got to do it this way, basically. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so we're looking at Hitler and the emergence of Nazi, the Nazi party. Um, we're going to start off back in 1889, so we're kind of getting a little wishy-washy here. Um, the reason why we started in 1889 is that's the year Hitler was born. Okay? We're going to go all, all the way up until 1923. I put 1920 because that's when the, the Nazi party finally made its establishment. Um, and then we'll go to 1923, and I'm not going to ruin the fun for you guys. So you got to wait and listen to that. Okay, here we go. So the economic, social, political, and cultural differences that characterize the Weimar Republic made possible the rise of extremist parties such as the Nazis. Such political groups flourish in times of turmoil and extreme dissatisfaction. But it is important to remember that the Nazi party was more effective than the others in appealing to the discontented and in capturing popular support. Much of the Nazi success was due to the charismatic leadership of the Austrian provincial Adolf Hitler, who was convinced of his own greatness. Now, if we look into the early life of Adolf Hitler, he was born on April 20th, 1889, in the Austrian village of Brum au Inn, near the Bavarian frontier. His father, Alois, was an Austrian customs official. The Hitler family was of peasant stock, although Alois, though his petty, or through his petty bureaucratic position, was the first to break the pattern and enter the lower middle class. Adolf was the fourth child of Alois's third wife, third wife, Clara Potzel. There is no real evidence to support the assertion of some that Alois's father, and hence Adolf's grandfather, was Jewish. Okay, uh, there was that theory that went around. So, like I said, I'm going to do this. Uh, there was that theory ran around. Uh, it was probably 15, 20 years ago, and I'm glad the author put this in here. I think it was in the new edition that he put. Um, 
that Hitler's parents were Jewish, and that's why Hitler hated the Jews. It's not true. There's no evidence that proves that Clara or Alois was Jewish at all. Um, so we should keep that in mind. Another thing, another point of emphasis I want to tell you, um, he was born in Austria. Okay, he was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, which means that he was not technically a German. Um, something to think about. Okay, another thing too, we look at Alois. Um, he, Alois, started off. He was a very intelligent person. Um, he was a heavy bureaucrat in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And uh, you can see Alois up there, his ugly mug. And we can see um, that he de-progressed. He went down in the social society rung, basically. Um, he kind of lost his respect. You also look, like I said, you look at the German Empire there in the 1880s, and the 1890s, and you see the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, right there. And you'll see he was born outside of Vienna uh, during that time on the Danube River. Okay? Um, this is what his house looks like. It, it, uh, it was, or no, this is where he was born. Excuse me. Um, it's not like what it is now. This is like a, a two thousand picture from like two thousand five or two thousand eight. Um, and then you see a picture of Hitler there as well. Okay. Um, so it definitely had changed since then. Okay. Um, and actually, there's a really cool history on that too. Um, they debated on whether or not to tear down that place where he was born because they actually put a rock that dedicated the the uh, the birthplace of Adolf Hitler there and uh, they didn't like that very much so there's still debate on whether or not that should be removed or not so hey great research project right there if you want to do something okay all right oh sorry Adolf's fa father who was stern and had a bad temper wanted Adolf to follow in his footsteps and become a civil servant Young Adolf was contemptuous of his father's wishes for himself, and the two had a tense and stormy relationship. Adolf was much closer to his mother, who was described by her doctor as a simple, modest, kindly woman with a long oval face with beautifully expressive gray-blue eyes. To compensate for her husband's harshness towards the children, Clara smothered them with love. After Alois's death in 1903, she indulged every wish of the teenage Adolf. Hitler returned his mother's affection and later wrote, I had honored my father but loved my mother. Young Adolf was a willful, indulgent child with strong opinions. His early education was satisfactory, but he was a total failure in the secondary technical school in the city of Linz, where Alois had settled his family. The family continued to live there until after Alois's death. Claiming illness, Hitler left school in 1905. The real reason was his failing grades. Even in geography and history, which he claimed in his autobiographical Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, were his favorite subjects in which he led his class, he received only mediocre marks. Hitler sucked at history and geography. You catching my drift? Okay, I hope so. History and geography is important enough. <coughs> After dropping out of high school, the teenage Hitler idled away the next two, day, two and a half years in Linz, drawing, painting, writing poetry, going to the theater, and daydreaming. In many ways, this period of Hitler's life, especially as revealed by his youthful Linz friend and companion, August Kubizic, foreshadows much of his later life pattern. According to Kubizic, Hitler was a dreamer who preferred creating fantasies to doing any real work. His mania for redesigning and reconstructing cities appears in his grandiose plans for the rebuilding of Linz, which is the city. As Kubizic uh, related, the more remote the realization of a project was, the more he did steep himself in it. To him, these projects were in every detail as actual as though they were already executed. Hitler believed that one day he would carry out his projects. According to Kubizic, the young Hitler was impatient moody, irritable if contradicted, and prone to outbursts of temper. He disdained regular work, preferring to live in what he considered the life of an artist. He was a compulsive talker, inclined to giving dramatic speeches in which he was carried away by his own emotions. He was extraordinarily serious. He approached the problem with which he was concerned with the deadly earnestness, which ill-suited his 16 or 17 years. 
Willful and determined, the young Adolf, contrary to the wishes of his mother and brother-in-law, decided to pursue art as his career. In September 1907, Hitler left Linz to go to Vienna, where he applied to the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts. His painting samples were declared unsatisfactory, and he was refused admission. The director suggested architecture, but Hitler needed a diploma from secondary school to enroll in a school of architecture. He did not have one and was certainly unwilling to take the final exams to get one. He returned briefly to Linz for his mother's death in December 1907, a deeply emotional experience he had because he had lost the only creature on earth on whom he had concentrated his love and who had loved him in return. This is the word of Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler. In February 1908, he returned to Vienna and remained there until 1913. In between 1908 and 1913, basically, he spent his time as a hobo. Just hope you know, basically. He slept on the streets. Uh, he did not do anything significant in his life during that time. When were you? Uh, 1908 and to 1913. Basically, a matter of about five years. Okay. Oops, I lost my page. Here we go. He was joined in Vienna by his friend Kubizik, who enrolled as a music student in the Vienna Conservatory and roomed with Hitler for almost six months. Kubizik has given us an account of how Hitler spent his days in Vienna, frequenting museums and libraries. At night, he went to the opera, especially to see the works of Richard, Re excuse me, not Richard, Richard Wagner, okay? Today is Mozart's birthday. I hope you know he was born on this day in 1765, on a cold January Sunday in uh, Austria, just so you know. Not Germany, I actually looked that up. I was misinformed on that. Richard Wagner is a very well-known uh, German composer uh, for classical music, if you didn't know. And we will see that Hitler looked up quite a bit to him. Anyways, uh, he saw his favorite Lohengrin about 10 times. As in his Linz days, Hitler continued to create fanatic projects. He began an opera, started a play, and drew up detailed architectural plans for the reconstruction of Vienna. When Kubizik asked him one day what he was doing, Hitler responded, I am working on the solution of the housing problem in Vienna, and I am doing certain research for this purpose. I therefore have to go around a lot. Kubizik left Vienna in July 1908 for an army stint. When he returned in November, planning to room again with Hitler, he discovered that his friend had moved without leaving a forwarding address. From late 1908 to 1913, Hitler's Viennese years were spent in the shadowy world of public shelters and hostels for men. There you go. Increasingly, as his early sources of income dried up, Hitler's financial circumstances became more difficult. During these years, Hitler pieced together the fragments of the, uh, that's a lot of German words, Weltenschein, Weltenschein, uh, whatever that word is, uh, that he would never change. In this period, took shape within me a world, excuse me, this is from Hitler. In this period, there took shape within me a world and a philosophy, which became the granite foundation of all my acts. In addition to what I then created, I have had to learn little, and I have had to alter nothing. This world picture was based on the political ideas and movements around the social conflicts of early 20th century Vienna. What were the influences Hitler experienced there in Vienna? Here's the influences on Hitler's development. In Mein Kampf, Hitler refers to two of the political figures who made a significant impact on him. George von Schuerner and Karl, Karl Luger. I think I'm going to skip this paragraph here. Sorry, we don't need to learn about Schuerner and Hitler's attitude, uh, we'll talk about his, uh, <clears throat> oh, okay, we'll talk about Luger for a second. Luger was the mayor of Vienna and the leader of the anti-Semitic Christian Social Party. Hitler, with his usual lack of moderation, referred to him as the greatest German mayor of all times and a statesman greater than the so-called diplomats of this time. He wrote that in Mein Kampf. He especially admired Luger's demagogic, er, demagogic method, including his ability to use propaganda to appeal to the masses. Hitler believed that Luger understood the policy, politics of a mass party form with the aid of emotional slogans. Part of Luger's appeal lay in his clever manipulation of anti-Semitism, 
Although Hitler felt that Luger merely used it for political purposes without correctly understanding the racial significance of anti-Semitism. Luger also failed, in Hitler's eyes, to grasp, grasp the significance of German nationalism since he continued to support the multinational Austrian state. Hitler concluded in his assessment of Schooner and Luger with these comparisons. Um, I'll say it. The Pan-German movement was right in its theoretical view about the aim of the German rena um, Renaissance, but unfortunate in its choice of methods. It was nationalistic, but unhappily not socialistic, or socialistic yeah, enough to win the masses. But its anti-Semitism was based on a correct understanding of the importance of the racial problem. The Christian school social movement had an unclear conception of the aim of a German reawakening, but it had intelligence and luck in seeking its methods as a party. It understood the importance of the social question aired in its struggle against the Jews and had no notion of the power of a national idea. In these comments, Hitler established the contours of his own Nazi party. It would be based on a strong German nationalism, socialism, or at least Hitler's version of it in his attempt to win over the masses, and extreme anti-Semitism. Hitler's attitudes towards anti-Semitism were probably most influenced by an ex-Catholic monk named Adolf Lanz, who called himself Lanz von Liebenfels. Liebenfels founded the quasi-religious Order of the New Templars, who primar whose, primary, excuse me, whose primary purpose was to fo foster ariosophical doctrines. I don't know what that means, so don't ask me. Aristocracy was a combination of occult ideas, German Volkish nationalism, and anti-Semitism. Okay, there you go. Liebenfels uh, established a new Templar's castle on the Danube in 1907 and proudly flew a swastika flag over it. He wrote in a series of occult works that presented his aristocratical philosophy, although his major work, uh, Theozoology, written in 1904, contained the essence of his thought. That philosophy was based on the supposed superior, superiority of Ario Germans. The Arian was an exalted spiritual being. And he quotes, the Arian hero on this planet is the most complete incarnation of God in the spirit. And that is from Wolfert Daim, Der Mann, Der Hitler, Die Eidengab. Um, it's from the author's translation. Jews, as well as other allegedly inferior races, were characterized as animal men who must someday be eliminated by genetic selection, sterilization, deportations, forced labor, and an even direct liquid, excuse me, liquidation. Direct liquidation. That's what it says. The elimination of the animal men made possible the coming of a, a higher new man or the Aryan superhero. Liebenfels also propagated his occult ra racial views in a magazine called Ostara, which was one of the periodicals that uh, Hitler read to enlighten himself on the racial problem. Richard Wagner was also another important influence on the ideas of early Hitler. Remember, Richard Wagner was the, the German composer that Hitler often watched or heard of. Uh, if you ever heard of Richard Wagner, he's got really good music. If you ever heard of Valkyrie, Anybody heard it? Yeah. Now yeah, I'm taking a choir lesson here. Look at that guy. Um, that is Richard Wagner who wrote that. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Die Valkyrie. Yeah. You want to look it up real quick? Yeah. Look it up. It might. It might be Franz Liszt, but I think it is. Wait. How do you? What's it called? Die Valkyrie. V A L K Y R I E. Richard Wagner. Wait, Wagner. Wagner. Yep. Remember the W's? Oh, yes, 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 sorry. Yep. Did he write it? Um, musical drama by Richard. Bam! I got it right. Look at that. Okay. Me being a musical Written genius. In 1856. 1856. Yep. Okay. Hitler once claimed that he had heard Tristan, I think that's another uh, play that, that Wagner did, 30 or 40 times and always from the best companies. He was also influenced by the composer's life and political ideas and later claimed that he had no forerunners except Richard Wagner. One of Wagner's appeals to the young Hitler was the myth of the outsider, who follows his own rhythms and is forced to oppose the straight-laced social order of his day, determined by tradition. In Wagner's Rienzi and Lohengrin, Hitler could see aspects of his own rejection 
by the world. The need to dominate is also an underlying theme in much of Wagner's music, and from his urge came Hitler's attempts to overwhelm through imposing demonstrations of power. The later public ceremonies of the Third Reich, with their massive stage effects, owe much to the influence of Wagner's operas on Hitler. If his time in Vienna was of the formative period of Hitler's world picture and philosophy, what were then the basic ideas that he absorbed and made an ideology that, would he, he, that he would adhere to for the rest of his life? Racial anti-Semitism was clearly at the core of his ideas. Moreover, Hitler had become an extreme German nationalist who favored the union of all German peoples. Anti-Semitism and nationalism were, of course, stock ideas in the bourgeois world of Linz and Vienna. Viennese mass politics gave Hitler practical examples of effective use of propaganda and terror by political parties. Finally, underlying all of his beliefs was a strong conviction of the need for struggle. The world was a brutal place filled with constant struggle for existence in which only the fit survived. Hitler may have gathered his view of life from his experience in Vienna, but these social Darwinist ideas were also prevalent both in the bourgeois circle of Vienna and in the works of people such as Lanz von, Le er, Lanz von Liebenfeld. Hitler's years in Vienna served as the foundation for his later experiences. There he developed an ideology from which he deviated little for the rest of his life. He had the conviction of a closed-minded fanatic who sees no need to pursue new ideas in response to new situations. Adolf Hitler never doubted that the world could be seen in only one way, which was his way. Vienna had been a time of despair because of his frustration and not being recognized as, as the great artist and genius that he believed himself to be. The rejected Hitler projected his anger and hatred against the Jews, the bourgeois world, the rich, and the aristocrats. He could blame everyone for his personal disasters except the one person who was actually responsible, himself. Adolf Hitler left Vienna in 1913 with no real purpose, hating a world that had rejected him, but convinced that he would someday be recognized. In May 1913, Hitler moved to Munich. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, let's take a minute or two intermission. Uh, so we'll talk about it here in just a second. Yeah. This is gonna be, you're gonna get it's gonna be real interesting here. Just a hot second. Yeah, why are there people there? Yeah. How'd they find his face? It's like a where's Waldo thing. Yeah. Yeah. What's up? Wait, what, what? part here. This was that was the boring part. Well, some of it was in the reading that yeah. And you can keep the quarter. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. I am such a bit. Hey, what, was, what do you want? Uh, I have a gift for you. I have a gift. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. No deal there. What is that? Wait, why well, it's Kate, but I have my, my computer was overloaded. Okay, here, just a second. Okay, you know what, from what I took out of this, because I was, like, randomly hands-on things, so I don't remember. Yeah. Um, when he's talking about, like, stuff about him and his mom, it sounds like he was a mom of boy. He was definitely a mom definitely. of boy. Yeah. But there's a good reason, too. Yeah. yeah. His dad, his dad just, yeah. It's so obscure, because you think, I don't know whether Hitler had daddy issues or not. Yeah, because it seems... Like, but like he, it seemed like his childhood with his dad being the way he is towards him. Yeah. Could that be a reason why he was the way he was? Like I just, I don't want to like say like 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 an idea or anything. You know what right, saying, right. But, like, it certainly it? could be. I mean, if we look at a lot like psychologically speaking, if we look childhood at childhood criminals. Yeah, because it's yes, trauma. if you look at childhood trauma and criminals. Definitely. Th there's a correlation, yeah. right? We know that there's this correlation there. Psychologically, so it's possible, right? And and with Hitler being buttered up by his mom yeah. and neglected and abused by his dad, essentially, 
what like what constitutes that? So yeah, I, I don't know about that. And I, I go back and forth about it all the time. Like it certainly sheds light on Hitler's life, but it doesn't justify it. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. Um, those paintings that we saw a few slides back were those paintings. Yes, yes, oh, so this is, I know, but they were rejected. So this is one painting that he did uh, during World War One when he was serving in the trenches. This is debated by historians whether it was or was not done. Um, this, this monastery is what he refers to, uh, but we don't really know. If it's his? If it's his or not. We, we can claim that it's his, um, and this actually, so, if you want to do a good research project, this is really cool, Hitler's artwork. This painting, they don't know whether it was Hitler's or not, but it did sell for almost half a million dollars. That's amazing. And it just sold like last year. I found it funny, in the articles we read, when we did the discussion with him, said he would, like, when it was like, you know, Kong and God, he'd take out his art set and just paint the landscape. Mm -hmm. Like, that is so funny to me, and yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. But if you, you think about artists, they have a very like weird mentality. Have you ever watched Blown Away? I know the song. Or, <laughs> yeah, Blown Away. <laughs> I've been watching it. It's like the glass. It's a glass blowing competition. It's on Netflix. It's super good. Um, but you see how artists like the weirdos really kind of make it because they're outside the box creativity. And this is where you really kind of make it. So, yeah. And we can look into this a lot more. Like, if this was Hitler, why did he put a, a fountain of, like, it looks like a, a gutter that goes down to spray onto this little teeny tiny door here? Is that the door of opportunity or the door to hell? As opposed to this gate where it's very pretty, it's shaded by a tree, the fountain's on this side. So, and then you look at the colors. Why is it rusty here? Why is it rusty down here on this side? It looks, um, it looks good though. Yeah, it looks super clean here, right, in this area. So it, it, there could be evidence that Hitler somehow may have had influence on this, but it's the real thing. I don't know. I don't know. They don't know. It, 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 looks, it looks like it could be a monastery courtyard, and a monastery is where the captain of the Brazil would be practicing. done it in So, yeah, I don't I don't know. But it definitely shows signs of a Vienna German style with the way the brick is arranged and the steep hill and then the way the uh, the, the uh, chimneys go out. You're talking about how they like architecture and stuff? Yes. So maybe he made this up in his mind if it wasn't somewhere? Maybe, yeah. And just because he's such a good at architecture, it looks like a real building. Yes. And then uh, we just talked about it. He was studying architecture specifically, right? Because he wanted to try to get into the Vienna School of Architecture. Wait, so how do they know that this may be his painting? Like, how do they not know? Like, it's, it, I don't know. I have, that, that's, that's, that's above my art history pay grade. Oh, this sounds so <laughs> horrible, but you know, like, the, the question, like, oh, he's going back for, like, 10 minutes and, like, talk to us. What if you did that with him, but just to get his art to it? Just like, to get his art? Yeah, yeah like, 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 like doodle explain. me or something? Like, like no, like, like, what? I don't really know what she asked. Yeah, yeah. Wait, Emma, so yeah, like, like, some people are like, oh, he brings him back for like 10 minutes or something. Just like, I want him to explain his art. Right. Like, yeah, that yeah. was, that okay, was here's so the thing. I know I'm not supposed to like, play on those lit ideas and stuff, oh, but I'm sure that School of Vienna really regretted oh. not accepting <laughs> Oh, uh, they I don't know. Like, oh, okay. I, would, I would say maybe, maybe they're glad that he never got accepted. It seems like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. like from the last <laughs> I got it. what you're supposed to do. Oh, I got so, it. Oh, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. All right. Wait, but the last thing that you read was it seemed like he was just wanting to have any dumb. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought, too. Yeah. I wonder how, how good the people that actually did get accepted were, because this is, like, pretty good. So if he didn't get accepted with this, then yeah. I Yeah. And I don't know if this was his submission either. I don't know if he submitted this as part of his work or not. Um, like I said, I don't know with this one on the left here if that's even true or not. Yeah. So it's, it's debatable. Mm -hmm. It's nice though. No, I like wait, it. wait, ask him, ask him. Hey, okay. Can What's we, that? Wait, wait, hold on. Can we do our propaganda like project on the, this propaganda? This like specific like communist. Ah. Uh, well, it's like supposed to be like communist and German like together. 
Yeah, if you guys want to, that's fine. <laughs> okay, so is it for us? Yeah, is, is it okay if yeah, it's for us? Yes, as long as it is, it, you can find research that definitively proves that it's propaganda. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it's propaganda. Yeah. I, I don't mind if you do communist Russia. Yeah. If you want to, you don't have to. But if you want to get like a present target for it, yeah. You can. Okay, we're gonna move on. <clears throat> here we go. Thank you. Munich and World War One. Sorry, I'm gonna move on here. Okay. In May 1913, Hitler moved to Munich. He claimed that he had made the move because of his passionate dislike of the Austrian Empire and his longing for the art capital of Bavaria. His real reason was to escape Austrian military obligations. Huh? Ironic. Although the authorities caught up with the draft dodger, he was rejected as physically unfit for military service. Yes, that was it. Physically unfit for military service. Munich brought no real change to Hitler's life. He continued to sell his paintings to keep alive. The escape from Vienna and the move to Germany had solved nothing. He had no real future in sight. The outbreak of World War I proved to be his salvation. To me, these hours seemed like a release from the painful feeling of my youth. Overpowered by my stormy enthusiasm, I fell down on my knees and thanked heaven from an overflowing heart for granting me the good fortune of being permitted to live at this time. This is from an excerpt of my copy. Hitler then volunteered for the Bavarian army and was accepted on August 3rd, 1914. At the age of 25, Adolf Hitler last found a purpose in his life. The formerly undisciplined Bohemian, uh, excuse me, Bohemian now accepted a grueling regimen for the sake of serving a greater purpose, Germany's greatness. Hitler threw himself into the war with great energy. As a dispatch runner, he distinguished himself by his courageous acts and received the Iron Cross First Class Selected, or, excuse me, seldom awarded to enlisted men. He was, however, promoted only to corporal. His dedicated patriotism and willingness to sacrifice his personal interests for higher ideals made him unattractive to his fellow soldiers. A loner who shunned common vices, Hitler simply did not fit in with other soldiers. But the military was a clear-cut system of order and values, and its sense of male camaraderie made him a great impact on Hitler's later lifestyle. So, too, did the excitement and discipline of war. The news of Germany's defeat, which he had heard while being treated in a military hospital for temporary blindness from a gas attack on the front, touched Hitler to the core of his being. Although he grieved for Germany, his own newfound existence was uh, returned to his wretched pre-war condition. To Hitler, the war could not have been lost by the army. Defeated, defeat had been caused by the weakness of the home front. This is what most German uh, army members believe. The army had suffered a Jewish Marxist stab in the back. Okay, you guys can see that. Um, some of you guys are talking about this. This is a picture here of Hitler and the outbreak of World War I. This is an extraordinary pho photograph taken at the Odeonsplatz in uh, Munich on August 2nd, 1914. The 25-year-old Adolf Hitler can be seen celebrating the outbreak of World War I. You can see him right there. You can see he has a full mustache too. Okay. Well, well, it's not I mean, a it's handlebar. It's I ain't no handlebar mustache. But it's longer. Yeah. Actually, so I was in uh, the CDP today. I was talking with a guy. There's this guy. His his name's Mr. Walker. I think he's an Ivy Tech welding instructor. <clears throat> he's got a hell of a handlebar mustache. I'm just saying. So if you want to go check out a handlebar mustache, go. Have you seen him, Kinley? Yeah. He's got, whoo, man, that's a good looking mustache. Anyway. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to write something up here on the board, and you're welcome to write it down if you want to. If you don't want to, that's fine, too. Uh, I got I to gotta look at it, though, because it's a long word, okay? That's one word. word, long word. Deutsch. This is the Deutsch. not as long word. Oops. So many consonants.
Yeah, it's kind of like where's Waldo there, right? Okay, so this this word, this is one word, this is one word, and this is one word, okay? National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeit, Arbeit der Party, okay? If you look at it closely, you can see an N, an S, National Socialist Deutsch, meaning Germany, A as an Arbiter, and Party, okay? National Socialist German Arbiter means workers, okay? And Party obviously means party, okay? Not with like cone hats, but with like politics, okay? You guys get my White cone hats. Huh? Go no. ahead. <laughs> okay, so NSDAP, that's how that word comes out. National Socialist Day, Deutsch Arbeit der Partei. Whoa! Okay, just a fun fact for you guys. When I talk about the NSDAP, it means uh, NSDAP, okay? And how the word Nazi comes out is from this NSDAP. If we look at the banners uh, during the parades and ceremonies of Adolf Hitler, you see this, okay? You also see it N S D A P, okay? And how it goes out is N National East A Social Z Deutsch Socialist to say uh, Arbor Party Na Z. Okay? Because it's Na Z. <laughs> it makes sense again. National Socialist. N A Z I. Okay? That's how it works. Nazi party. So that's how you, the word, yeah, go ahead. That's how the word comes about. Okay. Alright, moving on. No, oh, I'm going to skip a couple paragraphs. Uh, oh, I already read that. Okay, upon his return to Munich after the war, Hitler remained in the army during the post war turmoil in Munich. That saw the temporary establishment of the Soviet Republic in April 1919. Hitler's German nationalistic enthusiasm led his superiors to appoint him as an information officer which could indoctrinate his fellow soldiers with German ideals. We already talked about this. His job is also in detailed observation of small right-wing parties that might ultimately be of assistance, assistance to the German army. Uh, the German Workers' Party, also known as the DAP, was merely one of many right-wing Volkish national nationalist parties in Munich. The Bavarian capital was especially conducive to extreme right-wing politics. In 1919, the army and free corps groups had crushed the Soviet Republic and established the moderate socialist government in Bavaria. Bavaria, excuse me. But in 1920, the time of the cap push in Berlin, a coup replaced the socialist government and went to right-wing... We don't really need those. Sorry. Uh, the Bavarian rightist regime provided a haven for the extremist activities of the right-wing Volkist nationalist groups. One of the most important of these groups was the Thule Society. Okay? The Thule Society was basically a continuation of the Germanic order, whose first lodge was established in Berlin in 1912. Modeled after the organization of Freemasonry, the aims of the Germanic order were to achieve German racial purity, a result of its Volkist nationalism, and attack the Jews and established Germans as the leaders of Europe. In 1917, uh, I don't care about that, sorry. In his 1933 book, Bevor Hitler Kam, Before Hitler Came, Sabatendorf, which was the man who founded the Thule Society, claimed that the Thule Society was of great importance to the founding of Hitler, Hitler's National Socialist Movement. It was Thule people who, whom Hitler first came, and it was the Thule people who first united themselves with Hitler. No doubt, Sabatendorf exaggerated his own significance. There is no evidence that he and Hitler ever met. Nevertheless, the DAP, which Hitler joined and later renamed, was founded by the railway mechanic Anton Drexler early in 1919 under the chairmanship of Carl, Carl Herr. Okay, it doesn't matter. Now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting like ahead of myself. Okay? This is where you're going to see the beginning of the NSDAP here. You're going to see... Uh, you won't see outright the swastika, but you're going to start see, seeing labels of the parties there, okay? And they're going to be on their left arm, okay? Um, this was not just something that you hear uh, at the beginning of the Holocaust where they just began to start wearing those sashes, uh, red sashes or black sashes. Um, this was something that went on. It's been, it was that way back in the early 1800s when they start to identify with political parties. If you'd identify with political parties, you would put in a certain sash. 
over your left or your right uh, le upper arm, and that's how you would identify it. And this is a specific example of that, okay? Um, and this also says, down with Marxism. Okay, basically. It's in Latin, though, not German. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. In Mein Kampf, Hitler gave his own version of the relationship with the DAP, the work German Workers' Party. After attending a meeting in which Gottfried Feder spoke on fin finance capital and the elimination of capitalism, Hitler was prevailed upon to join the party as a member of 55, and at the same time, member uh, seven of the executive committee. The small party of mediocrities gave Hitler an outlet for his own political interests, and especially an opportunity to play a leading role. As propaganda chairman of the party, that's who he was, Hitler was able to develop his organizational skills, but above all, to discover his oratorical talents. A month after joining the party as a result of his first major speech, on October 16, 1919, he found that he could speak. Thereafter, he spoke regularly at DAP gatherings as well as to other vocal groups outside of Munich. <coughs> from his position on the executive committee, Hitler began to gradually change the DAP from a mere discussion group to a noisy, publicly seeking party of struggle and mass political party. Okay? Uh, da -da 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 -da. We're not going to do that. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, let's go here. In the spring and summer of 1920, Adolf Hitler was basically a local Munich politician who spoke night after night in rowdy beer halls to win people over to national socialist ideals. Hitler perceived the need to separate the NSDAP from the numerous small-time national focus groups vying for attention in the post-war Bavarian capital. Hitler possessed one advantage in his pursuit of popular <coughs> attention. He had absolutely no scruples with anyone. He was willing to use any methods, including brawls and riots, to get attention. As he said in Mein Kampf, at that time, I adopted the standpoint. It makes no difference whatever, whenever they laugh at us or revile us, whether they represent us as clowns or criminals. The main thing that is they mention us, that they concern themselves with us again and again. Sounds pretty extreme, right? To some people attracted to the Nazi party, Hitler was a mass drummer who could be used to popularize Volkish nationalist policies. One of the keys to Hitler's rise to effectiveness as a politician would be his ability to use people who planned to use him. In his early years as a Munich politician, Hitler seemed willing to play the role of drummer to gain mass support for the nationalist cause. Eventually, however, he would be satisfied with nothing less than complete leadership. Um... Here's the problem. When Drexler attempted to merge the NSDAP with a Volkish party in Augsburg during Hitler's absence, uh, because, sorry, I didn't see why. Oh, sorry, yeah, he was absent um, because of a uh, divide he had with the executives. Hitler reacted dramatically and forcefully because of his absence. On July 11th, 1921, he announced his resignation from the party. He demanded the acceptance of two conditions before he would rejoin. Number one, election of a new executive committee with himself as first chairman of the party with dictatorial powers. Sounds kind of weird. And two, complete primacy of the Munich local branch over all other Nazi groups in and outside of Bavaria. Although the old line members of the party objected, they also realized Hitler's indispensability to the party and capitulated to his demands. Hitler was now able to begin constructing his leadership, constructing his leadership as a central principle of the party. He called himself the leader of the NSDAP, and others now began to speak of the Nazi movement as the Hitler movement. Okay? So again, we see here, as we already know, Hitler was not elected into office. He wasn't even elected into his political party. He seized control of it, basically. And then he found out how to be appointed a chancellor, which we'll find out a little bit later. By the end of 1921, the Nazi party was rapidly becoming an instrument of Adolf Hitler. Its organizational structure became authoritarian after Hitler's establishment of dictatorial party leadership. The leader principle, or um, Führer Prinzip, is what the German thing is, and a military command structure, excuse me, constituted the essence of the National Socialist Party organization. Hitler was thus unwilling to compromise or fuel or fuse with other nationalists and vocish parties 
and groups in southern Germany and Austria. For Hitler and others could join the NSDAP if they were willing to submit to the authoritarian structure of the party. In Mein Kampf, Hitler had emphasized the importance of propaganda and organization in the development of a mass political movement. The function of propaganda is to attract supporters. The function of organization is to win members. Propaganda works on the general public from the standpoint of an idea and makes them ripe for the victory of this idea. While the organization achieves victory by the persistent, organic, and militant union of these supporters who seem willing and able to carry on the fight for victory. In the years of struggle, as the Nazis referred to the party's efforts to survive and grow, Hitler placed much emphasis on developing a strong organizational structure. Hitler perceived clearly the importance of physical trappings in the organization of the NSDAP. Symbols could unify the party by making members feel important and create a wider appeal by drawing attention in mass demonstrations. Hitler chose the swastika as the official party emblem. The swastika was an ancient occult symbol involving the power of the sun. It had been adopted in Germany and Austria by occult Volkish groups as a symbol of Aryan anti-Semitic movements. The Templars of Lanz von Liebenfels, uh, the German or Germanic Order, and the Thule Society of Rudolf uh, Sabatendorf had all used it. It was not Hitler's invention, despite his claim to the contrary in Mein Kampf, but it was his de uh, decision to use it officially for the party. He introduced the heads of the local groups that members were to always wear party badges carrying a swastika. In 1920, Hitler uh, introduced the outraised arm Heil salute, which I'm not going to make, which he had borrowed from Austrian Volkish parties. The wearing of uniforms with party badges and the use of flags and standards at meetings became more commonplace. Reviews, parades, and the use of ceremonies with flag dedications became visible symbols of the growing Nazi strength. <laughs> Hitler appreciated physical symbols and mass meetings as methods of achieving a sense of identification and a feeling of belonging by party members. Mass meetings served another purpose as well, unleashing mass propaganda techniques for winning public support. These meetings were very emotional and included a major speech as well as a panoply, pana, panoply, panoply, I've never heard that word before, of flags, standards, parades, and martial music. With his free time and enormous energy, Hitler was able to hold a mass meeting every week. Between November 1919 and November 1920, he spoke at 31 meetings out of the 48 that were held. In his speeches, Hitler railed against the peace of Versailles, Marxism, international capitalism, the November criminals, and of course, the Jews. A recording secretary summarized one of his speeches. Uh, we won't talk about it. Hitler always emphasized the need to reduce ideas to simple slogans for mass consumption. The Nazi party's mass meetings with Adolf Hitler as chief speaker became increasingly effective. Crowds of hundreds grew to thousands in the early 1920s. To reinforce his mass propaganda techniques, Hitler and the Nazi party realized the importance of a party newspaper. The Munich Observer, the uh, racialist organ of the Thule Society, was purchased by the party with the help of army funds. Renamed the People's Observer, it became the official party newspaper. Hitler, as the party's propaganda chief, exercised considerable control over the paper's editorial content. You also see the outstretched arm there. That is the Heil symbol. Okay? Please do not do that. Uh, we'll talk about the SA here, okay? Under Hitler's direction, the Nazi party was becoming one of the most noticeable of the numerous right-wing Volkish groups in Bavaria. These groups shared a basic belief that their eventual goal was to overthrow the Weimar government. Hitler, too, shared this goal. By the beginning of 1923, he had rejected the participation of the NSDAP in electoral activity in favor of cooperative armed uprising. For that reason, the party's paramilitary unit, the SA, became uh, to be increasingly emphasized. Okay, so not the SS, but the SA, uh, which stands for the Sturmat. Excuse me, Sturmabteilung, Sturmabteilung. Uh, if anybody wants to try that word, I'll wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the symbol on the one person's shirt up there? Is that a specific symbol? Uh, it... you're talking about this guy? Yes. So that is the German SA symbol. It's kind of weird. It looks goofy. 
Um, yeah, you will see it like makes an S. This is not a very good rendition of it, um, but it makes like an S and an A kind of look there. So Wait, kind sorry. Of, that is a Nazi German symbol. Yes. I got lost. What are we not supposed to do? Uh, stretch out your arm and make the high old side. Oh, oh, don't okay. And I, I know. I was like, wait, what oh, am I not supposed to do? Just don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can do what you want, but I encourage you not to do that. Yeah, a little okay. enough. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> um, you also see here images of the SA specifically. There, um, this was their formal uniform, and this was their uh, regular dress. I guess you can call it that. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about. It. The SA had been established as a gymnastic and sports division within the Nazi movement during the summer of 1921. So originally, it was just a sports thing. As the armed part of the movement, it was organized along military lines and used primarily to defend the party in meeting halls and on streets, as well as to break up the meetings of other parties. In October 1921, after a series of victorious brawls, Hitler labeled the party militia as the Sturmabte Lunge or stormtroops. The SA added an element of force and terror growing, excuse me, force and terror to the growing Nazi movement. Hitler believed that terror had its own magnetic power and could be used not only to intimidate people, but to also attract new followers, specifically young people who wanted to get in shape and wanted to be a part of an army without directly being involved in the Weimar Republic. Because obviously the Weimar Republic was not very favorable. The SA grew rapidly by recruiting ex-soldiers and volunteers from the Free Corps. Some entire unit of Free Corps, such as the Free Corps of Rosbach under Edmund Hines, subsequently a brutal SA group leader, joined the SA. Increasingly, young people were attracted to a group that offered adventure in secret meetings, parades, the painting of slogans on buildings, and fighting with opponents. In February 1921, a National Socialist Student Organization with its own SA troop was founded at the University of Munich. From its founding in 1921, the SA had grown to 15,000 members by 1923, and roughly two years, a gain of 15,000 people. The adoption of the official brown shirt uniform that same year gave the SA its distinctive military appearance, and you also see that. Although Adolf Hitler soon became the unquestioned leader of the Nazi party, a number of individuals played important roles in the early history of the party. Some even eventually became prominent leaders in Nazi Germany. The two who achieved more for the early Nazi party than anyone except for Hitler was Ernst Röhm, this is the guy on the left here, and Dietrich Eckhart. Okay? That's the same person. Different people. No. Is what? it the same person? No. Look at that. They look the same. Oh, man. Wait, 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 are they actually the same person? Wait, what? I'm confusion. It might be. Oh, they're tw twins! <laughs> I, I just looked up some pictures. Twinning. They might be. It might be the same person. <coughs> uh, Eckert. I couldn't really find a whole lot on. It. Rome came from an old Bavarian family. Obviously, they're ugly people, though. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Rome came from an old Bavarian family of civil servants. A captain in the Reichswehr. He joined the DAP in November 1919. He promoted Hitler's political career by providing followers, arms, and financial support for the struggling young party. As a military officer, Rome could introduce Hitler to nationalistic officers and politicians. The support of the army was crucial to the early survival of the Nazi party. Okay? Again, I'm going to repeat that. The support of the army was crucial to the early survival of the Nazi party. Rome's skills as a military organizer enabled him to help build up the SA as party troops. Dietrich Eckert was a mediocre poet and dramatist who blamed the Jews for his lack of success. Eckert was an associate of the Thule Society and came to the DAP through it. Eckert interpreted, interpreted the immediate post-war years in apocalyptic terms as time of tribulations that would elicit the coming Third Reich. Uh, we won't read his thing. Uh, don't need to read that. Okay. Uh, talking about Eckert again, he authored the Nazi battle cry, Deutschland erwacht, which is Germany awake. Hitler acknowledged the importance of Eckert when he called him the spiritual co-founder of Nazism and dedicated Mein Kampf to that man, who was one of the best, who devoted his life to the awakening of his, our people, in his writings, in his thoughts, and finally in his deeds. Um, 
One of Hitler's early party comrades and a dominant figure in his immediate entourage was Ermin Esther. Esther was a crude person who indulged in sinister account of Jewish activities. Nevertheless, he was an effective rabble-rouser, and Hitler used him as an editor of the Volkischer Beobachter and as chief of party propaganda beginning in 1921. Rudolf Hess, you've probably heard of him. An early party comrade was outstanding in his Slavist devotion to Hitler. A student of political science at the University of Munich, Hess joined the Nazi party in 1920 after hearing a Hitler speech. He became a rabid believer in Nazi ideology and established a student group of SA stormtroopers at the university. His intense need for a strong authority figure led to his complete and unwavering devotion to Hitler. Ermin Göring, who later became the number two man in the Third Reich as Hitler's designated successor, was not typical of the early Nazi leadership. He came from an upper-class background and married the daughter of a wealthy Swedish aristocratic family. The last commander of the famous Rick Tolfin fighter squadron in World War I, Goring was a much-decorated pilot and war, war hero. Although Goring was a strong German nationalist and anti-communist, he cared little for Nazi ideology. He joined the Nazi party because of his need for action, adventure, and camaraderie and a hunger for power. Hitler was delighted with the respectability Goring brought to the Nazis as an aristocrat and genuine war hero. He was made leader of the SA in 1922. All right, we'll look at the social analysis of the party in the movie done. Since the night, yeah. say what? So yeah. I know we're. I haven't got to the beer hall put yet, but I'm, I'm probably just waiting until Friday for that. Uh, since the 1930s, historians have frequently asserted that the Nazi movement was a lower middle class phenomenon. Recent sociological analysis of the composition of the Nazi movement, however, has shown that while the lower middle class was somewhat overrepresented regarding membership in the votes, votes cast, the Nazi party also drew significant support from the working classes and social elites. It was, in many ways, a true people's party. The Nazi party appealed to all segments of the German population. As seen in the party's title, Hitler and the early Nazi leaders tried to attract workers away from the social democratic and communist parties. Before 1925, however, they were only partially successful. Although workers, both skilled and unskilled, constituted 36% of the party's membership in 1923, they were underrepresented in comparison with the entire German population, of which workers constituted 55%. Uh, the lower middle, no, we won't talk about it. Uh, Nazism was especially attractive because of its anti-Semitism. Jews were seen as large or as owners of large department stores and hence a threat to lower middle class merchants and artisans. Farmers were also susceptible to a firm tradition of rural anti-Semitism and were inclined to accept those stereotypes of the Jewish cattle dealer and the Jewish Marxist revolutionary in the city. Uh, skip that part there. We might get to it. No, we're not going to do that. Uh, many Nazi, early Nazi students were drawn to the militaristic SA within the NSDAP. Other members of the elite, such as manufacturers, publishers, and aristocrats, were attracted to the Nazis as an instrument for the restoration of the old imperial order. Even some academics and intellectuals, especially in Munich, joined the party. Indeed, as historian Michael Cater has concluded, from 1919 to 1923, the Nazi party, far from being a perfect mirror image of the social profile of the leading nation, contained, albeit in varying proportions, elements of every important social segment in the country, so that it potentially assumed an integrative function in German society. Basically, he's saying that it was not exactly all about the NSDAP yet, but it was really attractive to a lot of people. Two other characteristics stand out in the social profile of rank and file membership. The Nazi party was a youthful party. If the men who founded the original Nazi party were in their early 30s, the men who joined tend to be even younger. In 1923, the mean age of newcomers, the average age, was 27. And almost 50% of all joiners were 23 or younger. Most of these new members were also male. Hitler and the early Nazi leaders believed in male supremacy and reflected this belief by formally excluding women from party leadership positions as of January of 1921. 
The 10% female membership in the Nazi party in 1919 had declined to 5% by 1923, as women realized the party was controlled by male values and militaristic ideals. Let's talk about the beer hall footage on Friday. Well, thank you. Conclude. I like reading. I feel like you guys. Yeah, I listen. I always listen and just like scrolling with my phone, and I drew some things, and then I. <coughs> I don't, like, I don't like that. That was interesting. It was interesting. Oh, I guess it had low battery. So like it. It's easier than being a Want me to stop this? Uh, it already stopped, didn't it? No.